Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatos. I am Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And we still are in the Book of John, the Gospel of John, and uh, obviously one of my favorite books of the Bible. I suppose that uh, you know, at any given time, whatever book I'm in is probably going to be my favorite. And of course, it is all one book, sixty-six books contained in in one, but yet they are all the same book, part of the same uh, finished work by God's hand. So um, we're looking at chapter 9, and once again, you know, we are reading at an NLT, and uh, again, it's a, um, it's a thought-for-thought thought translation, um, you know, and so because of that, you know, the, the literal uh, side of it is less. That doesn't mean that it's not an accurate translation, although it is a narrow translation. Um, some of the uh, some of the the wording um, is a little um, uh, assumptive, I guess you could say. You know, they they kind of assume, and and you know, a, a lot of the modern translations they pull from the previous translations, and so um, it's kind of like uh, you know, like when you Xerox a area. Uh, that's I probably just dated myself saying that, but like if you you make a copy of a copy. And it, it, it loses a little little bit more of its clarity every time. It's still the same document, but it loses a little bit of its clarity. And so we'll see that here. Um, and so in, uh, in John chapter 9, you know, you have this, this part where this, this man's born, born blind. He's been born blind. And so the disciples, see, at that time they had a doctrine that if someone was born with some kind of crippling thing, you know, or they were, they were blind or they were deaf or they were mute or something along that line, uh, they must have, it must have been a, their, either their parents' sin or their own sin. And so the disciples ask Jesus this, well, who, who, why was he born blind? Was it because of his, his sin or his parents' sin? Actually, they probably would have done a better job if they had just asked Jesus, why was he born blind? The truth is he was born blind because sin is in the world, not specifically his parents' sin or his own sin. So Jesus just simply says it's, it wasn't his parents' sin or, or his sin that he was born blind. And really, in the original text, he says, but that the works of God may be made manifest, we need to work the works that God's given us while it's still day. You know, and so he didn't really say why the man was born blind. The NLT uh, assumes that, it, it, the way that it reads, it, it kind of assumes that it was be, it was so that God could work a miracle in the man, but that would make God unjust, um, and so that's not really what happened here. And um, you know we'll we'll get to that in a minute here, but but, but let's go ahead and pray. I, I I you know before we actually start reading, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I ask Lord God that you would give us clarity, that you would give us insight and instruction as we go through your word. I pray for that spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the knowledge of you, the understand, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know what it is that you desire to show us. And so I thank you for these things. And in Jesus' name, amen. And so, yeah, so uh, that note on translation is simply because this is not the text. You know, and once again, people used to ask me, well, what uh, what's the, the most accurate translation? And really, it's, it's like if you if you want, if you really want the 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 most accurate, you're going to have to learn the Greek and the Hebrew and get into the into the text, uh, because they, they are translating from text. And any time you translate from one language to another, there's going to be things lost in translation because there's nuance of meaning in every language that cannot necessarily be articulated in another. And so that's uh, why I've made this note here. We talked about there's certain key things, but we have to look at the whole. Uh, scripture, and we have to look at it in context of God's character. What is his revealed character? And his revealed character is that he does not put uh, uh, sickness or disease on people just so that he can remove it and make himself glorified. That would that would make him um, that would make him unjust. The simple reality is is that when he made man, we saw that there was no sickness or disease. None of that is mentioned until after the fall. And so, because sin entered the world. That makes mankind susceptible to to maladies, to disease, to sickness, to to uh, things that 
are opposed to God's original plan and design. And so God has a God has power over these things, and so He 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 may remove them. And so uh, so in chapter nine it says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. And so this is this is the whole reason I gave that whole intro, because it's, Jesus answered this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So uh, the implication would seem like he's, like from this this writing is that, that God did this, but but really, that's not exactly what he said, even in this translation. It just said this happened, you know, uh, so the power of God could be seen in him. God did not put this on him. But I remember asking God about things like blindness and deafness and things uh, one time. And he said, well, I mean, the, I, I say it like like he said a matter of factly. No, he didn't really, the, the what he explained to me the way that I could understand it is that even somebody who is blind, even somebody who is deaf, uh, whatever, they, they, that's only, they, they, they only have that, the loss of that, they still have a, lo a great deal of functionality, and they still have a free will, and they still can do a great deal of good. That's not to say that God will not he open the eyes of the blind, or open the ears of the deaf, or heal people, because we see that Jesus does it. So that means that God is not unwilling to address those needs. But again, everything has to do with faith, how a person receives. And uh, so it's like the two blind men that followed Jesus into the house on that one occasion. They asked him to heal him, and he said, do you believe I can do this for you? So that if they did not really believe that he could do it for them, then they wouldn't have had their eyes opened. And so it's like I was explaining to my daughter one time about about uh, health, because the word says in, in Proverbs that God's words are life to all those who find them and health and healing to all their flesh. So we're talking about divine health, you know, blessed health, you know, and so um, she wasn't feeling good. And she was like, but, you know, I prayed and I don't, I don't feel any difference. Like, well, how, but see, how are you believing? You know, because Jesus said, whatever things you ask for, believe that you receive them and then you will have them. And so but the way we can liken that is, I said, to you, I said, we have a refrigerator. I said, do we have milk in the refrigerator right now? She said, well, yeah. I said, are we drinking it right now? She said, no. I said, but it's available. And so that's the way we have to look at these things that God is willing, that he, that he has said and revealed in his word, that he is willing to provide based on how we are willing to believe and receive. So it's available. And so it's not, it's not on God if we do not uh, receive it and so it could be because he's made it available and so i think anybody who um you, you know if you if you have kids then and they and and you have things in the fridge for them to get if they if they're if they're crying i'm i you know i'm i'm thirsty well go in there and get it it's it's in there for you if they're old enough to get it themselves then then you expect them to do it and so it's not on you if they don't do it or even if you if you don't have kids if you ever had somebody a house guest or something and well, you know, whatever you want's in the fridge, you can go get it. And so it's not on us, or, you know, if our house guest does not take advantage of what we've offered, the same thing with God. So then, uh, moving on down, he said in verse 4, he says, We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. So you notice how Jesus puts uh, the assignment. He, is, he has, basically, he's like, we, the disciples, and by extension us, have entered into his labor with him. And so he is saying, God has assigned us things to do, and we must do them. And in this case, Jesus' assignment is to open the eyes of this man born blind. And so he says, while I am here in the world, or no, he says, the night is coming, sorry, the last part of verse 4, night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means, or Siloam means scent. So the blind man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, No, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, Yes, I am the same one. They asked, Who healed you? What happened? He told them, The man they called Jesus made mud 
and spread it over my eyes and told me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. And so, you know, it's interesting because Jesus, so these all, because remember, I, I mentioned in the last episode, and, and um, you know, it seemed in my, in my heart that people have a hard time, uh, you know, receiving that, you mean, I can, I can do stuff like this. You can at the direction of the Holy Spirit. If you've said out loud, Jesus is your Lord, and you believe in your heart, God's risen him from the dead. You're not only a child of God, now adopted into the household of God, but you've also entered into a co-laboring with Jesus. And so you do have assignments from God. And the word says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that all of the gifts of the Spirit, and there's nine gifts of the Spirit listed there, are uh, they operate as the Spirit wills, but each, each person who calls upon the name of Jesus is a candidate to be used uh, by the Holy Spirit to perform any of those gifts at any given time. We cannot do them just uh, by our own desire or our own plan. Um, they are as the Spirit wills. And so Jesus chose to set aside, according to Philipp the, the book of Philippians, to set aside his divine privilege and power. And he relied on the power of the Holy Spirit in the direction of the Father. And so he did this at the direction of the Father. Does it mean that anytime someone has uh, is, is blind that we, we spit in the mud and make a, make a paste and, and spread it over their eyes? No. Jesus did this at the will of the Father. And so this is what we call a gift of healing in operation. And it's at the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we only ever see Jesus do this one time. And he's healed many blind people. This is the only time he's ever done it. So it's not a formula. It's not a, oh, uh, spit plus mud equals sight. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, and so uh, it's just, a, it's just an, a, a gift of healing in operation by the direction of the Holy Spirit. So he says, um, uh, so he said Jesus is the one that did it, and he told him, he, he spread mud over his eyes and told him to go to the pool and come back, and he came back seeing. In verse 12, uh, where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind, and demanded, What's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. <laughs> and so this is interesting. So the man, they, they're like, Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? And, and they're going back and forth. Well, Jesus had already told them, if you if you really knew the scriptures, you would recognize that I that I'm the Messiah because everything that Jesus had done uh, was already foretold in the scriptures. He's like these point to me. So so G Jesus is is like I, he he doesn't he's like I don't need to prove myself to anybody. He's like he's he's the Messiah. He doesn't need their he doesn't need their approval. He doesn't need their stamp of approval. You know, and uh, they for some reason think that he does. And they're like, well, if he's if he's doing this stuff on the Sabbath, then he can't be from God. And other people are like, yeah, but how could a sinner do this? You know, and we see we get a little bit more insight from the man himself in a second here, because first he says, I think he must be a prophet. And um, then verse 18, the Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? And if so, how, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said he's old enough. Ask him. So this is always about um, the approval of man versus the approval of God. And I think it's I think that the reason that people kind of knuckle under to uh, men is because that is that is a an approval that is tangible. They can see that they they can they you know if if some human leader says you're good, then they're like okay I'm good. But if they if they are seeking God's approval instead of man's, you you have to do that by faith. You can't you know because God's not necessarily going to part the clouds and say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. That's not for now. That's for after uh, we we have continued believing, even though we don't see. And so to seek the approval of God means to have faith that I've done what God told me to do. Therefore, I believe that uh, that I that that I have God's approval. I'm going to continue walking in the way He said to walk. And uh, that's always more difficult, you know. And so again, you know, the Pharisees have. Uh, said anyone who um, says Jesus is the Messiah, we're going to put them out of the synagogue. So now you had you had the temple that was run by the, Fer- the, the the Sadducees, and you had the synagogues that were run by the Pharisees. And the synagogues um, are very similar to how we do church today in the modern world, where you've got a building, you've got a meeting place, you come, you you sing some songs, you do scripture, you know, you have some fellowship, you may eat a meal, and then you go home. And very similar, in fact, the way that we do our worship services is we adopted largely from the Jews. Because you've got to remember that at the beginning of the church, uh, the entire church was Jewish. And so then the early Christians uh, were all Jews. And then when Gentiles started becoming Christians, where Jesus made it clear that that we are welcome in his uh, in his church, um, if we if we do what he says, well, then. Um, they learned from the Jews. This is how you. This is how you do church. So the temple was uh, destroyed in AD seventy. But before it was destroyed, this, you had what the the Sadducees that were in charge of it, and they were they were highly influenced by Greek thought, and so there was a, a discord among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So uh, the the Pharisees were in charge of the synagogues or the the, the churches, you know, the church buildings where the people would meet for teaching. And the Sadducees were in charge of the temple where the people would go for sacrifice and prayer. And uh, so there was a shift that took place after the temple was destroyed, where it was only uh, synagogues and then later churches. Um, you know, and so, uh, but this, so in this case, they're like, well, we don't want to be excommunicated from the church. And so we're going to just tell, say, you know, he can answer for himself. And so they put it over onto their son now. So then in verse 24, it says, So for the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Verse 25, I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind, and now I can see. So this is all faith. I mean, the guy, and you can see the guy, because they're pressing him, he is edging more towards just faith and getting away from uh, the the accepted uh, the accepted doctrine of the Pharisees, and he is now getting more. You know, he they're edging more and more into um, into the letter of the law, and he is edging more and more <clears throat> over to the spirit of the law. Well, I can, but I can see, you know. And so, in verse twenty six, but what did he do? They asked, "How did he heal you?" Look, the man exclaimed, "I told you once." Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> Verse 28, Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Now, I, I love this exchange because the man just ha- he just has an honest faith, and, and uh, he, he's not willing to go back on it. Now, and he's, he's, even, he's gone from going, Well, I think he must be a prophet, to I, I want to become his disciple, you know, and so they say, well, we don't know where he comes. He comes from in verse thirty. Uh, why that's very strange. The man replied, "He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from." We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but He is ready to hear those who worship Him and do His will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not of God, he couldn't have done it. And and so you have some um, there's some cross there's some some um, some crossing of of doctrine here that's that's going to cause a problem. So this man we ha- he was born blind. Apparently he has asked around because he can't read the scriptures. He's blind. So he and they didn't have braille then. So he's asked around apparently and found out and asked about miraculous healing because 
no, he, he's like from the beginning of the world, no one has op- we know no one's opened the eyes of one who's been born blind. They did have miracles. We saw miracles in the Old Testament. But he's like, no one's been ever, ever able to open someone who's, who, uh, someone's eyes who was born blind. So this man's done his research. And he, so he's like, he has to be from God. You know, he, he's like, this, this type of miracle, he has to be from God. This is this, is this man's uh, conclusion. Thank you. And so they say, in verse 34, you were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. So now they have excommunicated him from the synagogue. He's no longer allowed to come back. And what, so they're not willing to let go of some of their doctrines. And their doctrine is wrong because they... So God had said in the old covenant, the old covenant, that people who were crippled and blind and deaf they could not come into the temple area. It's not because God is discriminating against them. It's because everything under the Old Testament was affected by the physical, because of the way uh, that mankind was twisted in sin, and because of the, the the sin nature. Now God has superseded that in the new covenant. Uh, and, but see, it, still under that old, that old covenant, the, the, they were not allowed to come in. That didn't mean that they weren't a part of the community. It didn't mean that they weren't in covenant with God. But they couldn't come in, and God didn't really explain why. But God said, this is the way it is. And so that's what they had to go by. But they made a mistake by making this doctrine that, well, since they can't come into the temple, they must have been to- born in sin. Well, now that's a false doctrine. Because nobody is born in sin, you're born with a sin nature, and then sin is not imputed until a person reaches the age of accountability, according to the scripture. And God doesn't give, he doesn't give us an age of accountability, it's different for everybody, it depends on uh, when, the, the first time that they came to a crossroads between doing something evil and doing and following God's way, and they chose to do something evil knowingly. That's the moment that they're now accountable. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so no, he wasn't born in, in a total sinner. Um, this, that's their mistake. They're not willing to let go of that doctrine. And that's the reason I bring it up is because the disciples asked Jesus about that at the beginning of the chapter. And he's like, no, neither this man or, or his, his parents' sin had anything to do with him being born blind. So Jesus put an end to that doctrine with the disciples and the Pharisees are still stuck in it. And so in verse 34, or 35, excuse me, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? See, I love this, because Jesus heard what happened. He heard that the man is like, the the man got kicked out of the synagogue because he put his trust in Jesus. So Jesus finds him and and, uh, asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 36, the man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. See, because he knows Jesus. He knows that Jesus opened his eyes. Verse 37, you have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Then verse 38, yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Why did he worship Jesus? See, he, he, he's like, he has gone from um, saying I, he must be a prophet to I want to be his disciple to he's, he is the Messiah. You know, this this is this is the conclusion that the man has come to based on what Jesus is saying. And Jesus deals with people on a personal level because he is like, who who is the son of man? I want to believe in him. And Jesus is like, you who have both seen him. See, this is a man who was born blind. He hasn't been seeing for very long. And he's like, you've seen him and he's talking to you right now. And so this this is a uh, a very personal encounter that this man is having with Jesus, and so he worships Jesus, and it's appropriate that he does so. So verse 39, then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. And so he's talking about, uh, he's like, I came to bring sight to the blind. Is he talking about uh, physical sight or spiritual sight? Both, apparently. And then, so he, he, so, but again, he, he's speaking to this man. It's, it's just, it's just fascinating how he is still talking to the man about his purpose, why he has come. And uh, so he says, I entered the world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. 
but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. So now he's talking about a spiritual blindness because they claim that they know better. They claim, you know, they, they, they're holding on to um, this intellectual pride of, well, we know the scriptures. Well, if you, but Jesus' point was, if you really knew the scriptures, if you knew the intent of the scriptures and the heart of the scriptures, then you would recognize me as being from God. So he is like, you claim you know better, and therefore you are spiritually blind. So that's the point that Jesus is making to them. Um, so yeah, this is a good place to stop. Let's go ahead and pray. And uh, lately, you know, we've just been doing one chapter at a time, but that's okay because these chapters in John are long and they're deep. So um, yeah, let's pray. So Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, for... Uh, your spiritual sight. I thank you for restoring our sight, Lord, and showing us how we are to perceive the world through your eyes and how we are to perceive the, the scriptures through your eyes, to really understand, to look past the surface and to see and to render with just judgment the things that you want us to, to understand and the, the, the things that you want us to walk in and the works that you want us to walk in. And I thank you for these things. I ask that you bless all those who tune in here with me. I thank you for them. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys. And we will see you again.